This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo. This week, the Oncogene Brief comes uh, to you from Chicago at the annual meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. And in this episode, we are talking to Dr. Adil Akhtar. Uh, Dr. Akhtar is an oncologist and palliative care expert. He is associate professor of the Department of Medical Oncology and Hematology in the Oakland University William Beaumont School of Medicine. He is also the director of the inpatient clinical operations at the Carmanos McLaren Oakland Cancer Center in Michigan and chief of the division of palliative and end-of-life care uh, at Michigan Health Professionals. Dr. Adkar, welcome to the Oncogene Brief. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Now, before we're going to talk a little bit about what you do in terms of uh, treatment of patients uh, with a relatively new drug in, in the treatment of bladder cancer, tell me a little bit about yourself. So I'm a medical oncologist. I'm also board certified in palliative care and hospice. I love clinical practice, and that's what I do. I am more most comfortable amongst my patients. I consider myself to be my patient's patient advocate, mm-hmm. uh, and that's how I treat my patients. I'm also a artist, so I paint large scale murals. Oh wow, that's that's so, unexpected. <laughs> so that that I do in my spare time to uh, kind of decompress myself. Now um, you mentioned about decompress yourself. I think that at times when you talk to patients. There may be a lot of emotion involved, especially if you talk to patients that may have a rare form of cancer, patients that may have a situation where they may have to go to palliative care or to hospice even. Uh, that must be very hard at times. So I think it is hard, but uh, in a way it can become easier because if in the beginning of your re- relationship with the patient, So, in a cancer patient, you the, the patients go through different stages. So, first they develop symptoms, then they go to their pre- primary care physician, they undergo testing, they go to cancer specialist, they get a diagnosis, they get treatment, sometimes they get cured, sometimes they get relapse, and then eventually the end of life care so when i started my practice after my training i had made a decision that whenever i will see a patient i will reassure them that i am with them in life and death both and to this day i have followed that principle so if in the beginning you develop a relationship where you are very honest sincere and transparent with the patients when they go through the different stages of their diseases and life and come to a point where they are entering end of life then the discussion starts to become easier it's never easy but it starts to become easier because they have a basic trust on you to tell them the truth always i i think i think that is um, important uh, especially when you look at uh, the treatment options that are out there so many options for treatment and uh, if you are on the patient side uh, sometimes it's kind of mind Bugling. I mean, people don't know what what to expect from this treatment. Uh, we are here at uh, at ASCO, and then we uh, this is the American Society of Clinical Oncology, the annual meeting. And obviously, there is a lot of good news, a lot of very interesting news in how cancer can be treated. It is a conference uh, where uh, the, the best of the best are gathering to actually talk about um, ways to improve that. Uh, but for a patient, that might be difficult. So you mentioned something interesting. You said that you are a patient advocate. So does that mean that when you go to a meeting like this, um, that you take that information and then 
translate that for them in, in, in how much they can benefit from that or, or not? Actually, in the last half an hour, I was looking at the plenary sessions and one of the plenary session tomorrow is on uh, BRCA positive pancreatic cancer patients. And there's a newer drug which uh, is now, it will be reported tomorrow that after initial chemotherapy, that drug will be used as long-term maintenance in those patients. So right now, I'm actually uh, treating a patient like that. So I've got a BRCA-positive patient with pancreatic cancer, and I'm really ex excited to hear that talk because that will have a real-time value to one of my patients. So you're absolutely right that ASCO meeting has different value and meaning to different physicians. So for a clinician, the value and uh, the benefit is that you come to this meeting and you've got all kinds of patients under treatment and you're looking for specifically those studies which will actually change the care of your patients. So when you look at an ASCO meeting, for example, in that case, it is not just an academic meeting. It's actually a meeting with a lot of practical value for you. Absolutely, because, you know, in this year's meeting, I don't really think that there are many practice-changing studies, but from time to time, you come to ASCO meeting, there, there are multiple practice-changing uh, studies which are presented. So uh, this meeting is an outstanding meeting from the point of view, again, that if you are a researcher, academician, you have your area. If you are a clinician, you have a very clinically relevant studies being presented here. Now, among the things that uh, are being presented are some results of a relatively new drug. And it, it's a drug in which um, I think I heard you say it's personalized medicine. Mm -hmm. we, go to come, we, we talk a little bit about that later. But it is for a, a disease that's called bladder cancer or bladder cancer in general. Tell me a little bit about bladder cancer and how difficult that may be to treat and maybe what are some of the origins of that disease. So when we say bladder cancer, we are actually talking about the urinary bladder. So if we look at how urine is produced and then collected and then excreted out, the urine is basically produced in the kidneys and then through a system of collecting tubes, it goes and gets stored into the urinary bladder. So the urinary bladder is kind of a storage area for the urine. And then once the urine, uh, the bladder is full, the urine is then excreted out. The collecting system of the urine, which includes what we call the re renal pelvis, the ureter, and then the urinary bladder, is lined by a lining which is called urothelial epithelium. So bladder cancer arises from this urothelial epithelium. And nowadays, we actually call it a urothelial carcinoma. And the urothelial carcinoma can come from either bladder or the collecting system, including the renal pelvis and the ureter. From a treatment perspective, they are divided into basically two groups. One are those which are superficial and they are mostly treated surgically. And then there are muscle invasive uh, cancers. So breathe the urothelial epithelium, there is the muscle which contracts the bladder. 
So if the, the cancer starts in the lining, it can actually penetrate into the muscle. Mm -hmm. Once it starts to go into the muscle, it somehow or the other becomes aggressive and starts to spread. So right. once it enters the, the muscle, it becomes a high risk of spreading or metastasizing. So those muscle invasive tumors are treated differently. And then the third group is when the cancer has already metastasized. And once the bladder cancer metastasizes, it carries a really poor prognosis with really poor uh, survival numbers. Well, let's talk a little bit further about that uh, after the break. We here at the uh, ASCO meeting, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, with Dr. Akhtar. He is an oncologist and palliative care expert. He is an associate professor of the Department of Medical Oncology and Hematology at the Oakland University Wilhelm Beaumont School of Medicine. And after the break, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, bladder cancer and about treatment options that are there. Over the years, you've brought them into your home. You were prescribed opioids after the C-section and after dad's back injury. They helped when you were in pain, and you held on to them just in case. But did you know holding on to unused opioids puts your family at risk? Trouble with opioids can start at home with unused medicines, such as pills, patches, and syrups. You can remove the risk and protect your family. Find out how at www.fda.gov slash drug disposal. This is the Oncazine Brief with Peter Hofflin and Sonia Portillo. Welcome back. Uh, this is the Oncazine Brief. I'm Peter Hofflund. And this week um, we are in Chicago uh, for the American Society of Clinical Oncology annual meeting. And we talk to Dr. Uh, Akhtar. Dr. Akhtar is an oncologist. He is also a palliative care expert um, And we talked with him about bladder cancer and the treatment options and how much bladder cancer actually occurs um, in, in the American population. Can you tell me a little bit about that, Dr. Akhtar? Sure. So per year, there are uh, more than 150,000 cases in, in USA. And there are more than 30,000 deaths attributed to bladder cancers. I think it's the fourth most common cancers in males and about eight most common cancer in females. Uh, as I said, advanced bladder cancer carries a very poor uh, prognosis mm -hmm. and outcome. Now, as part of bladder cancer, we were referring earlier in the program about a new drug. Now, this new drug has to do with the fact that there's a lot of changing in the way uh, cancer is being treated. Um, we look at, as, as I think you mentioned that earlier, there is a seismic shift in the way we look at cancer uh, and how therapies, new therapies can actually treat um, different forms of cancer, including bladder cancer. Now, another term often used is in that seismic shift is personalized medicine or personalized therapies or precision medicine. Tell me a little bit about that, because there is a lot of confusion about uh, precision medicine, personalized medicine, because actually uh, a good friend of mine told me that every form of medicine needs to be personalized, otherwise it is not good for that individual. And also targeted therapies that is also being used. They're, they're kind of mixed together. When you look at bladder cancer, there is a unique position in that respect. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so... I went to the exhibition hall this afternoon. There are a number of uh, drug companies, biotech companies, mm -hmm. uh, who have uh, booths there. So I thought to myself that when I was doing my uh, training, it, it's the uh, mid-90s, uh, we only had a few chemotherapeutic agents. And what chemotherapy does is that 
we give chemotherapy to the patient, it goes, and the purpose of chemotherapy drugs is to kill cancer cells. But those drugs don't differentiate between normal and abnormal. So they kill the cancer cells because th those cells are dividing rapidly, but they also kill the normal cells too, and that's how they cause side effects. Something obviously you don't want to see, right? Right. So that was about 20, 25 years ago. Any cancer, you blast them with chemotherapy, and the hope was that these chemotherapy dr drugs will kill more cancer cells than the normal cells. That's really not a what we will call precision medicine. You go to the exhibition hall today, there are like hundreds and thousands of newer drugs. And what this revolution or this shift is that we have learned that every cancer type has some genetic changes. And for a few of these genetic changes or mutations, we have really good drugs. And we've got new drugs coming down the pipeline every day. So in precision medicine, what you do, you take the tumor and do a complete DNA sequencing mm -hmm. or specifically look for certain molecular changes or mutations. And then if you find something which is a potential target against which you've got an effective drug, you apply that drug to that patient's tumor. So that's one way of doing it. The other way is that now we've, we are realizing more and more that there are certain mutations or changes which occur in wide variety of uh, cancers. So there is a mutation called Antrac, which is common, or I should not say common, which is uh, present in wide variety of cancer types. So we have got a drug against it. It's called Larotrectinib. So in Antrac positive cancers, Sight doesn't matter. That, that is really unique, is it? It is very unique. And similarly, the, the drug we are talking about in bladder cancer, it's a drug against a mutation which we call FGFR gene mutation or alteration. So if I can take a couple of minutes to explain that. So... FGFR is a receptor which is present on certain normal cells. And the function of that recept receptor is to, when it gets combined with its ligand or growth factor, it creates some changes within the cell which then tells the cell nucleus to start dividing. When this receptor is abnormal, it's active all the time. That leads to cell proliferation all the time, leading to cancer transformation. So although it's more common in bladder cancers, but it also occurs in other cancer types like endometrial carcinomas, some breast cancers, ovarian carcinomas and certain non-small cell lung cancer types. So right now, the drug is called erdafitinib. It's E-R-D-A-F-I-T-I-N-I-B. And the trade na name is Balfbursha. It was just approved by the FDA recently to treat FGR, FGFR positive bladder cancers, but it could be applied to other tumor types too. And this study 
on bladder cancer was which is actually presented uh, this week it was originally presented last in the last year as schools meet, meeting and there are other agents also affecting the same mac- mechanism mm-hmm. which are being presented here in this meeting also so you mentioned earlier and and that's kind of intriguing that with the novel way of of certain personalized drugs we no longer i mean as you mentioned sight it's it's no longer necessary to say well this drug is very specific for breast cancer ovarian cancer uh, whatever form of cancer you have but they're actually working uh, on the genetic mutation that may be common in all the same kind of in the different forms of cancer that is obviously i mean you're an oncologist i mean that's going to dramatically change the way you treat patients it has it already actually has because now we are looking more and more for these actionable molecular alterations or mutations in all kinds of tumor types and 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 in my opinion the future really is in these uh, actionable mutations and more and more the field will get away from site specific cancers and we will change into the main basic mechanisms uh, specific cancers now let's take another break and after this break we're going to ask you a couple of questions um, where we started off the program with about palliative care and uh, to find out the importance of that in the care continuing the way people look at care i'm here with uh, dr akhtar he is um, an oncologist and palliative care specialist after the break we're going to talk a little bit more about this Most of us like to be out in the sun. That's why sunscreen and other safety measures are key to protecting your skin from aging and cancer. The FDA recommends using a sunscreen with an SPF of 15 or higher. Also, look for broad spectrum on the label. That means both harmful ultraviolet A and B rays are blocked. Remember, SPF plus broad spectrum equal healthy fun in the sun. Visit www.fda.gov/sunscreen for more information. A message from the US Food and Drug Administration. Some of the best sounds you'll ever hear are generic. Safe, effective, even money saving, just like FDA approved generic drugs. Even if they don't come in the exact same color or shape as their brand name equivalents, they have the same key ingredients and go through a rigorous review process. Talk to your doctor or pharmacist today and visit fda.gov/genericdrugs. Generics are safe, effective, and can save you money. You'll like the sound of that. This is the Oncozine Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo. Welcome back. Uh, this is the Oncozine Brief. I'm Peter Hoffman, and this week we are coming uh, from Chicago, where the American Association, or actually the American Society of Clinical Oncology, is uh, having their annual meeting. There are about 34, maybe even more uh, oncologists and hematologists gathered here uh, in Chicago talking about the latest kind of developments in oncology and hematology. Before the break, we were talking with Dr. Uh, Akhtar about a new drug, really unique in a way, how it can treat bladder cancer. We talk about uh, the fact that the drug may not necessarily be only for this particular indication may actually have a broader implication because we no longer look at a particular site of cancer but we're looking at the genetic alterations uh, which makes it now possible to look at cancers with a similar alteration and treat those alterations rather than a particular uh, form of cancer. Uh, Dr. Akhtar, we also you're also a specialist in palliative care. Um, in this meeting you actually are presenting a poster a poster about palliative care. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Uh, tell me a little bit about your research. So, uh, before I, I go into uh, uh, our uh, poster and our study, I just wanted to bring up an important point. Because uh, if you look at this ASCO meeting, and 
you look at all the wonderful treatments which are being presented here, you will see that majority of the the emphasis really is on treatment. And there is very little in the way of uh, palliative care, end-of-life care, supportive care, symptom management. So this needs to change, and this will require a cultural shift. So I'll give you a different way of looking at the cancer treatment. So right now, most of the cancer specialists, when we talk about cancer treatment, we treat cancer. And if you look at a patient's body, cancer still makes a small part of a patient's body. I think we need to change this whole discussion from trying to treat the cancer and ignore the rest of the body to treating the patient holistically with cancer. So I would define palliative care as treating a cancer patient as a patient holistically while treating the cancer. So in a way, palliative care becomes a holistic cancer treatment and management. And when we talk about palliative care, it is a team of dedicated individuals who will then take the time to sit down and not only talk about treatment options, but patients' goals in life and goals in treatment. So let me just talk about our program. So Michigan Health Professionals is close to a 400 physician organization in Michigan. We participate in a CMS program called Oncology Care Model or OCM, Medicare. uh, So we participate in the oncology care model. The pillar of oncology care model is providing high-quality care which is well-coordinated and which is cost-effective. So as a part of the program, the data flows between us and Medicare. So by the end of 2017, we received data from, from Medicare and one of the things which we noticed was that as a group, we were not doing a good job of involving palliative care and end-of-life care. So as a quality improvement initiative for 2018, we, said we, we took palliative care. And that really is a cultural shift because to this day, the awareness about uh, palliative care within physicians and as well as in patients is n- not that great. So we created a palliative care subcommittee, educated the physicians, made the referral process very easy, and then we started the program. So we are presenting the data from 2000 end of 2017 till March of this year, we have so far seen 409 palliative care patients. Out of that, we have uh, data from Medicare on 53 patients. And this is may, this may become a little bit complicated, but we have broken those patients into two groups. 28 patients accepted palliative care and were seen by our team. 25 patients did not. So those 25 patients are the control arm. We saw that in the last 30 days of the OCM episode, 
the palliative care group consumed almost 36% less money or resources as compared to non-palliative care group. That is not to me that exciting. Well, it, it is definitely noteworthy. It is very significant, but more exciting is that we have shifted the care location from hospitals and nursing homes, which the non-palliative care patients predominantly receive their care mm -hmm. at to patients' homes. Which, which is a major benefit for the patient. Which I think is the most exciting part of our research, yeah. that we are taking patients who would spend a significant amount of time in, in hospitals and nursing homes and keeping them home. And also patients who eventually died, they were utilizing hospice more in our palliative care group versus non-palliative care group. So that's the summary of our uh, poster presentation on Monday. And when you talk about less cost, um, you talk about less medication? So it's not only medication. I think the majority of savings occur when you shift the very expensive care in nursing homes and the hospital to home. Mm -hmm. Because providing the, the care at home is much cheaper, much cost-effective. That's number one. Number two, once the patient goes under hospice, they have de decided for themselves that th they want to stay home and they don't want to go back and forth between nursing homes, hospitals, and homes. Right. So, so that's another uh, avenue of uh, cost effectiveness. Right. Well, that's 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 quite uh, a feat, I must say. Congratulations with uh, with those results. That's really unique. And that that is actually the results that you're going to present uh, at On this Monday, meeting. On Monday, yes. On Monday, okay. I'll definitely have a chance to be there. I hope. Now, when you look at uh, an ASCO meeting like this, and you actually alluded a little bit to that, you have a patient for uh, which you uh, were actually attending a session to find out some of the stuff. But when you, when you look through your, I would almost say portfolio of patients, your, your number of patients that you do, you, you said you have a very unique bond with them. You're trying to build that bond. Are you now looking for each of those patients, uh, the kind of drug therapy, the kind of therapy that's out, out there? Is that something that you, you come here to do? Yeah, I mean, that that's one of the major intention to learn about newer therapies which are applicable in, in, in my patient population. Also, you come here and you know where the field is going. And number three, this year, my main purpose here is to start talking about the palliative care you know, end-of-life care make uh, people more aware of that. So you can use these meetings to start this cultural shift from just treating the, 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 the ca cancers to treating the patients as a whole. I, d I think that is um, definitely a major shift in the way we look at cancer, I think it's also maybe we were we were not used to that to do that in the past. It's definitely a cultural shift that's going to happen. Now let's take another break. We're here at the uh, ASCO meeting, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, with Dr. Akhtar. He is an oncologist and palliative care expert. He is an associate professor of the Department of Medical Oncology and Hematology at the Oakland University William de Beaumont School of Medicine. And after the break. We're going to talk a little bit more about treatment options.
Are you thinking about buying medicine online? A search for online pharmacies yields more than 20 million results. But which ones can you trust? Medicines bought from unlicensed online pharmacies can be dangerous. You may get a fake drug, your condition may get worse, or you may experience a bad reaction. Don't put your health at risk. To learn how to find an online pharmacy that's safe and legal, visit fda.gov slash besaferx. A message from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hofflin and Sonia Portillo. Welcome back. Uh, this is the Alcazine Brief. I'm Peter Hofflin. And this week we are in Chicago uh, for the American Society of Clinical Oncology annual meeting. And we talked to Dr. Uh, Akhtar. Dr. Akhtar, thank you very much uh, for joining us this afternoon. I think uh, we learned a lot of different things about uh, how... First of all, uh, there is a new drug for the treatment of bladder cancer, but most important that the options are right now much wider when we look at genetic modification or genetic alterations. And of course, the importance of palliative care in the total care continuum. So my final question is when you're an oncologist and you listen to this program and you're looking at your patient, the patient population that you're treating um, and you have not yet looked at palliative care as an option, what should you do? I think the first thing is to learn about it and and try to really see what palliative care is. In the beginning of the program, you actually very rightfully said that there's a lot of misconception about palliative care end-of-life care is palliative care, end-of-life care is hospice palliative care. I think as a practicing oncologist, our first job is to learn about what palliative care is and then learn about when we say we need to take care of the patient holistically, we need to talk to the patients about their goals, what they want to to achieve in life and from the treatment. Once we have learned what palliative care truthfully and truly is, then the process starts to become easier and easier. This I saw when we started the program in our organization. Uh, initially, there was a lot of resistance, but as we continue to educate our physicians, now everyone is very comfortable with the idea of involving our team. So I think it just takes time because, as I said, it's a you know cultural shift, and cultural shifts are always difficult and always take time. Okay, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Welcome back uh, to the Oncogene Brief. We're here uh, at the ASCO meeting, the American uh, Society of uh, Clinical Oncology. Over the last uh, half hour, 45 minutes, we've been talking with uh, Dr. Adil Akhtar about uh, different things with cancer different uh, applications of cancer, palliative care, very interesting. I'm here with Eric Grossenthal. Eric Grossenthal is uh, our uh, editor-at-large uh, for the journal, Ongesine. Uh, he's also uh, one of the co-producers of uh, uh, the Ongesine Brief. Eric, when you listen to um, uh, Dr. Uh, Akhtar and you hear him talk about uh, palliative care, but you also hear him talk about some of his other interests, what did you notice? You know, this is my 31st consecutive ASCO meeting. And in all those years, it's the first time I've actually heard an oncologist say that in a sense that they shop for um, sessions that might be relevant to specific patients. And I think that's an interesting concept for, for more for general oncologists than for those who specialize in a specific tumor type. If they have specific 
ca- patients who have a cancer that may be problematic or uh, they're working on, this is a wonderful opportunity to come and sort of look through the candy store of uh, sessions to see if there's a session that may be actually relevant and perhaps beneficial to that patient. And it's, it, I'm sure that happens a lot, but it was actually the first time I heard somebody articulate it. Yeah, I think it's, it was also also one of the things that I noticed um, because you expect doctors to come here with a mindset of, okay, I'm, I'm going to present some of the latest research and we're going to look at uh, the advancements that may come down the pipeline if you talk about phase one, phase two clinical trials. But really unique is the fact that uh, he is actually talking about his patients and yeah, it's, it, it almost, you know, it's almost precision medicine in, a, in another uh, sense that if you keep in mind specific patients and try to match therapies or uh, protocols that might be beneficial to them, it's just a, a unique way of looking at the meeting. You know, a lot of people come to keep up in the field specifically and generally. I don't know how many, and, and there may be many, but... I've just heard, never heard anybody articulate the fact that they're sort of looking for things that would be beneficial to patients they're working with. It. Right. Now, you've been here at meetings like this. I mean, I think you said 34? 31. 31. Okay, not that bad yet. 31 different ASCOs. If you look at, at ASCO in general, I mean, Dr. Um, uh, Atkar mentioned about this seismic shift. And if you go back in history, you recognize that as well? Well, the in in thirty some odd years, the practice of oncology has changed, changed dramatically. And many seminal, there have been many seminal moments at this meeting where uh, some of the um, practice changing events happen. It doesn't happen every year. Uh, most oncology, most medical research is incremental rather than, you know, that overused and exploited word breakthrough. But a lot of it's happened here um, historically in terms of. Um, well, let me put it this way. ASCO's recognition has changed dramatically over the years. In 1990, I was uh, asked to run the press room. It was in Washington. It was a much smaller press room. ASCO was not as well known at that point in time. Uh, it did not have the reputation as being the world's largest cancer clinical meeting. And it, it also wasn't so, something that was nat- on the in the eye of uh, industry and, and the stock market, uh, which happened a number of years ago, and they call that the ASCO effect, where, uh, where certain individuals might get hold of information prematurely and look at the market and see how that might affect it. They pretty much put a stop to that with the embargo system that they have in place right, right. now. Yeah. But ASCO has grown tremendously. When I, my first meeting, it was basically, did they did not have a executive director or EVP. They had basically a caretaker organization out of Chicago that was running it. And it's now has a very, very large uh, and and excellent professional staff, which just keeps growing. Right. There's also the staff that actually welcomes here, us here at uh, the meeting. Yeah. Well, it's always interesting because this is like the same time next year. I'm, I've been here without a, a dating myself. You know, I've been here when they met kids who were just out of school and, and now they've got college graduates or grandchildren and so it's sort of and everybody still seems to look the same yeah you, <laughs> you, you talk about the larger family of asco people and that was yeah there's, there's a, a number of old timers who who re- okay. refuse to stop coming well uh, thank you for um, sharing some of your thoughts with us i thought it was interesting because uh, uh, the interview with dr uh, Akhtar was uh, was quite interesting i mean it's very much uh, focusing on the practicality of a meeting like this there will be a lot of different kind of sessions coming in the in the coming days and, and sessions that we will be talking about in uh, upcoming programs. And I guess, again, quite interesting what uh, we will able to see in the treatment of cancer. Thanks, Eric. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. This was an episode of the Onkers in Brief, uh, this time uh, from Chicago during the uh, American Society of Clinical Oncology annual meeting. A slightly different format because we have the opportunity to talk with a lot of different people about cancer and cancer treatment. But um, if you want more information about cancer and cancer treatment, go to the website of the American Society of Clinical Oncology at asco.org, where you can actually find doctor-approved information. Uh, For us here at the Onkers in Brief, we want to thank you, our listeners, sponsors, and advertisers for your ongoing support. 
As always, uh, thanks to your support, our program now has a wider distribution via iHeartRadio, in addition to uh, PRX, Public Radio Exchange, and in the United Kingdom and mainland Europe via UK Health Radio. And your support made it possible that we can actually go to meetings like this, uh, but also now have a distribution in Canada and Australia. And you can also download us via iTunes and uh, via streaming media, uh, including Spotify. In Arizona, you can listen to the Ongazine Brief via Independent Talk 1100 KFNX, one of the 10 top um, radio stations, or the top 10 top radio stations in Arizona, reaching almost 5 million people throughout the state. For more information about what we do, uh, go to our online journal, Ongazine, at www.oncozine.com. And if you want to support our program, please visit our website at uh, Ongazine Acts and look for the Ongazine Brief. Here you can find more information about the way you can help and support us. If you live in the United States and want to receive our newsletter, text the word CANCER to 66866, and then we will make sure that you'll receive our newsletter, which includes an overview of the latest news in oncology and hematology, including sessions that are presented uh, this weekend here at uh, the annual meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Thank you all. Thank you for listening. and. Uh, Hopefully, you'll be able to uh, tune in to our next episode. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is The Youngest in Brief. The Oncazine Brief is produced for Sun Valley Communication by Peter Hofland, Sonia Portillo, Evan Wint, David Kaler, and Sean Mayer, and distributed by InPress Media Group. Support for The Oncazine Brief comes from listeners of this station and our commercial underwriters and advertisers. For more information about underwriting and sponsoring options, contact Sean Mayer in California at 949-923-1660 or visit our website at oncazine.com forward slash underwriting. The Oncazine Brief contains health and medicine related information and is provided for educational and entertainment purposes only. The content is not intended as a substitute for professional medical or health advice and does not replace your doctor's advice. Your doctor is the best person to answer questions about your personal health. If you hear something in this program that doesn't agree with what your doctor has told you, ask him or her about it.